I wrote a book called How Do You Know? And it's an, an attempt to apply general semantics to the world of finance and investing. And um, it's, it's the first attempt, so far as I know, since 1958 when a guy named John McGee wrote a book about um, general semantics and investing. And to kind of frame the, um, my talk a little bit, I want to start by reading you a story um, that was told by Irving Lee. And you probably know Irving Lee is one of the popularizers of, of general semantics in the 40s and 50s. And he wrote a book called uh, Language, Habits, and Human Affairs, which is a good read. And he also gave a talk called Talking Sense in 1952. You can watch it on YouTube, which I did, and, and it's very good. Anyway, he tells this story of, uh, prof uh, uh, involving President Eliot of Harvard. Uh, and so the story goes like this. Eliot entered a crowded New York restaurant and handed his hat to the doorman. After lunch, he goes to leave. As he came out, he was astonished to see the doorman promptly pick out his hat from the hundreds that were there and hand it to him. How did you know that was my hat, Elliot asked. I didn't know that was your hat, sir, said the doorman. Why then did you hand it to me? And the doorman very courteously replied, because, sir, you handed it to me. <laughs> and President Elliot was delighted with the precise delimitation of what the doorman saw and what he assumed. And so uh, I love that story because it's the doorman, sort of, he's the kind of exemplar of what we try to do in this room and keeping a high degree of, uh, I guess what Krzyzewski would call, <coughs> neuro-linguistic hygiene, which we lack in our discussions of, of finance and markets. And so I want to go through maybe some examples to show you uh, how using general semantics has helped me a lot clarify my analysis. And they're very, very simple tools. But it's amazing how people get these wrong, even professionals. And I'll have some examples that cost people a lot of money that uh, even a sim simple gen general semantic insight might have prevented. So first, uh, just think about the, the idea of a market itself. What does it mean when we, when we talk about that or when we hear journalists talk about the market? Usually, and we say, we say the market's up, we say the market's down, or the market's expensive. Usually they're referring to a specific index, and it's either the Dow Jones Industrial Average or the S&P 500. And the S&P 500 is probably the most widely cited market statistic when people are talking about the market. But there's some interesting things about the S&P 500. Number one is, even though there's 500 stocks in it, today, half of the value of the index is in five stocks. So a lot of times people own this S&P 500, 500 and think they're very well diversified, they have all these names, or well, really you're making a bet on these five stocks really make the difference. And those five stocks are the, are the biggest and uh, best performing stocks. The S&P 500 is uh, constructed by market cap size. So the biggest ones like Microsoft, Apple, uh, Amazon, uh, Google, Facebook, those are the five. And they're the most richly valued in the index as well. So when people say the market is expensive and they compare it to what it was in the past, you know, are, are, you, making a, are you making a valid comparison? because the S&P 500 changes over time as well. If you look at what the S&P 500 looked like in the year 2000, you have some very different names at the top. Uh, General Electric would have been in the top, ten, top five. ExxonMobil would have been in the top five. So uh, not only that, it changes uh, every year. There are names that are dropped out, and then there are names that are added in. Uh, so the S&P 500 literally does change over time. And sometimes there are significant rule changes. So, for example, one of the biggest was in 1976. Before 1976, there were no financials in the S&P 500. So think about that. There were no banks, no insurance companies. And in 1976, they made the decision to include them. So 60 companies went out of the index, and 60 companies come in, went in. So in, in the financial world, we do this all the time. We have these long time series, and we'll say the S&P 500 and we'll compare the price earnings ratio, say, of the S&P 500 today, what it was 15 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and we treat the S&P 500 as if it's just this one monolithic thing, and it really is not. So you probably already can guess what's the simple practical solution that general semantics would have. Um, that would remind you, what would you say? Yes, you just date, the, you just index or you could date the thing, and just say S&P 500 2018, is your own reminder that uh, you're talking about something that's not quite the same. Uh, there's an analogy an investor I know uses, 
and he, he says there's a temple in Japan that's 700 years old, and it's made entirely of wood. And over time, every piece of that temple has been replaced. <laughs> but we still refer to it as a 700-year-old temple, even though there's nothing in that temple that's 17, 700 years old. Uh, another uh, interesting example is, uh, I, I think of like a university. Like I, I went to the University of Maryland. so. But it's a very different place now than when it was when I went there. Of course, the faculty completely turned over. The students have completely turned over. And there are buildings now that exist that didn't exist when I was there. So it's really a, almost a different thing, even though we call it, still refer to it as the University of Maryland, as if it's one thing. And this extends to individual companies as well. If you look at a company like any company, you could say Berkshire Hathaway. Um, Berkshire Hathaway is constantly buying companies. And so the Berkshire Hathaway of today is very different than the Berkshire Hathaway of 15 years ago. They own companies now they didn't own back then. They have railroads now that contribute 30 or 40 percent of the earnings of Berkshire Hathaway. They didn't own them at all 15 years ago. So again, when you make these comparisons, we talk about Berkshire Hathaway as if it was one thing. A simple index or date would be um, a simple solution to that. One of the other things I love about general semantics is that you or we uh, constantly emphasize this in this idea of an environment. Um, we always consider some, uh, you know, an organism in its environment. And we, we always take into account the environment. So I'll give you one story from the book that I like a lot because I remember this uh, when it happened. It was in real, real time. I could see it unfold. Was there was a company that went public in 2011 called Arcos Dorados. And in Spanish, uh, in Spanish it means golden arches. So it was the McDonald's of, um, it was the McDonald's of South America. If you wanted to open a McDonald's franchise in Brazil or Argentina or Peru or Chile or anywhere, you had to go through these guys. So it went public, people got very excited about this because there weren't that many McDonald's in South America when you compared to the number uh, in the U.S. And the market got a very, very rich uh, premium and people were very excited. They do this math to show, you know, 10, 15 years from now as they close the gap with uh, North America, all the money that you're, you're going to make. But of course, um, again, a, ge a general semanticist would probably appreciate that a McDonald's in America is not the same as a McDonald's in Brazil. And the problem is that uh, McDonald's food is not cheap in South America as it is in the U.S. So the whole dynamic is it changes down there. It's much more of a, it's not expensive, but it's kind of a, it's more a middle, uh, it's more in the middle. So you're competing at a whole different level and everything that made McDonald's successful doesn't translate so well in that environment. Plus, you're dealing with lots of different countries, different currencies, uh, as opposed to the U.S. where it's one market. So this company uh, struggled tremendously because of those problems and lost 90% of its value from 2011 to 2015, not very long either. Uh, and again, so that, that, that's the idea that we think about the chain index where we consider the environment as well as uh, the, the individual uh, McDonald's. <coughs> one other one I like uh, a lot is, and the, this cost people a lot of money too, and see if you can figure out the problem here. So there was a company in Florida called St. Joe, and they were one of the largest real estate holders in Florida. They had over 600,000 acres of land in the Panhandle region around Destin. And some of this uh, includes miles and miles of beachfront property. So investors, again, got very excited about this. And this is, I'm going to read you a little short uh, three sentences from a research report where the guy is making the case to buy the stock. And this was very common. There's probably a dozen that were just like this. He writes, at a market cap of $3.6 billion, the market is valuing its land at about $5,700 an acre. That's a huge discount. Some of that land was selling for over $250,000 an acre a year ago. So you know the company is way undervalued. But do you? Because <laughs> what might be the simple thing you would do here as a general semanticist that to help differentiate what's going on here. Any guess? Lots of land. The land, right. The one acre. They're imputing that one acre is the same. Yeah. One acre one, acre two, acre three. They're, they're different acres. And um, there was an investor who did much more detailed work on it. And in 2010, he was betting against it. 
uh, it was going short, as we say. And he highlighted the simple fact that if you looked at much of St. Joe's land, it was a lot of it was rural, and it was worth as little as $900 an acre. And that's a far cry from $250,000 an acre. So um, this was another one where uh, the stock was $40 in 2008. Uh, it was $17 last year. That's 10 years later, and that's when, you know, during a period where the market, the S&P 500, tripled. So one of the other things uh, general semantics has helped me see in finance, we use a lot of labels. And we're constantly uh, um, labeling things, and they have a real impact on how the market thinks about what that is. So um, the market goes through various periods of enthusiasm for different things. So say, like I remember reading about how in the 60s, when uh, electronics was popular, companies would rename themselves so they could put electronics in their name and the stock would, would pop. And in the 19, 1990s was dot com, everybody wanted to have dot com in their name and when they put their name in there it would pop. Uh, last year the, the big um, theme was cryptocurrencies. So you saw all these lousy, cheap, uh, small, tiny companies add crypto to their name and their stocks would, would run up even though they might have no sales and they just have this idea that they're a crypto company. Um, this year, the hot uh, sector is marijuana or what the industry <laughs> likes to call itself cannabis. So the, the cannabis industry, um, there's a number of companies that have changed their name to add cannabis to their name and the, and the stocks have ripped. So here's one, uh, one story I want to read um, from the 1990s and it tells you everything you need to know about labels and names and it's amazing because this happens, like I say, happens every year and during all these cycles. So in 1999, there was a company called the Publishing Company of North America. Enviously eyeing the booming market for internet shares, management decided to change the company's names, name to attorneys.com. The stock doubled. All they did was change the name. And then the tech bubble burst and the stock fell more than 75% from its 2000 peak. Well, the firm decided to change its name again. This time, it took on 1-800-ATTORNEY. In days, the stock jumped 40 percent. So, you know, all this uh, battling over names means something in the market, so you can see why people, why people fight about it. Okay. Uh, I wanted to leave a lot of time for questioning, so um, let me, um, let's see. Um, one quick thing I'll say also is that studying uh, general semantics has, has, led, has helped me appreciate how complex the world really is. And, uh, uh, and cause and effect in the markets, we're constantly doing these correlations where we plot one thing against another and, and uh, you know, they don't, uh, we, we assume that one thing causes the other, but um, they're faulty assumptions and sometimes they'll hold for a period of time and then they'll break. And there's a guy who did a famous paper on this where he uh, took, uh, he went to find the best, just random statistics trying to find the best thing that would fit and explain the S&P 500 and he figured out it was U.S. cheese production and uh, butter produc production in Bangladesh. And if you knew those two things, you could predict the S&P 500 99 percent of the time. Of course, it only worked for a window and then it was, you know, then, then it was gone. One last thing, I want to read you a funny story, and, and it has to go with, uh, has to do with context, this idea that, um, and the Marks are always talking about things having value, but it really depends on the context and how we think about value. And this is a story from Rory Sutherland, and he explains how there's a train that goes from London to Paris, and the question put to a bunch of engineers was, how do we make the journey to Paris better? And they came up with a good engineering solution, solution, which was to knock off 40 minutes from the then three and a half hour journey at a cost of six billion pounds. But Rory Sutherland, who's a, a marketing guru, I guess, he says, you know, we always think about value in dollars and cents, but he says, you know, let's think about the trip itself. So his idea was what you should do is pay top male and female supermodels to walk the length of the train and hand out free champagne for the entire duration of the journey. <laughs> You'll have saved about four billion pounds, <laughs> and people will ask for the trains to be slowed down. <laughs> and, and he also tells this story. This one's probably made up, but he talks about uh, 
Ataturk, who was the founder of the uh, Republic of Turkey, and he wanted to secularize Turkey, and he wanted to discourage women from wearing the veil. And so normally, you know, a run-of-the-mill dictator would just say, ban the veil, but he was a, he was a lateral thinker. Yeah. And so what he said was he made it compulsory for prostitutes to wear the veil. <laughs> Suddenly, you didn't see any veils in uh, Istanbul. <laughs> And, and there's a real life story, this is a, this is a true story, a business story, which um, the company did something close to what Rory uh, recommended. And it was Southwest Airlines in their early days, they were, uh, this was 1973, and they have a flight from Houston to Dallas, and it cost 26 bucks to fly there. And they, they had trouble filling their planes, so they decided, well, we'll cut the price to 13 bucks. They filled the planes. But problem was, Braniff Airlines, which was the largest airline in Texas at the time, just matched their price. So now Southwest was back into the same boat they were before. And so this is a famous incident in Southwest, Southwest history where they meet, the executives meet over the weekend, they rack their brain to come up with a solution, and they finally came up with this idea. They offered flyers a choice. You could pay $13 or pay the regular fare of $26 and get a complimentary fifth of scotch, uh, whiskey, or vodka, your choice. So guess what happened? 86% of travelers took the free booze, and for a time, Southwest became the largest liquor distributor in the state of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, so that, my book basically is mostly about uh, having a sense of humility about what we can know and, and can't know. So I'll just end it with a, with a quote uh, from H.L. Mencken, which expresses this idea very well, I think. And he says, uh, I am never absolutely certain that I am right, and for the plain reason that I am never absolutely certain that anything is true. It may seem to me to be true, and I may be quite unable to imagine its falsity, but that is simply saying my imagination is limited, not that the proposition itself is immovably sound. Some other man, better born than I was, or drinking better liquor, may disprove it tomorrow, and if not tomorrow, then the day after tomorrow, or maybe next week, or next year. I know of no so-called truth that quite escapes this possibility. So thank you, and um, I'll take any questions. <laughs>